We are going to talk for the next two days about arguing. How many of you like arguing? We have liars in this room. Let's start over. How many of you, when you argue, you want to win? If your hand's not up, you are lying or you need counseling. One of the two. We are going to talk about arguing men and women because right now, as we are here outside Orlando, our nation is having a huge argument that impacts you, your children, and your grandchildren for decades to come. And how we respond to that argument as believers is going to dictate our national policy on abortion, doctor-assisted suicide, even the definition of marriage. And here are the two major questions we're arguing about as a nation tonight. Number one, is truth true? In other words, is moral truth real and knowable, or is it just a preference like choosing chocolate over vanilla? Secondly, what makes humans valuable? Are you and I valuable for what we are intrinsically, or only what we do functionally? And those two questions of truth and human value are driving all of the political debates you're seeing right now on those issues. Now, I've already noticed that some of you are taking notes faster than broke people at a Dave Ramsey seminar, and you're welcome to do that if you want to. That was a joke, an attempt to bond with my audience, and it <laughs> went down faster than the magic last year. But anyway, um, don't worry, I'm a Lakers fan. You think you got it bad. <laughs> We are going to supply you, because I'm going to email to Pastor Rick, exhaustive notes on everything I'm going to cover with you. Meaning, if you think you can leave and not come back tomorrow, your salvation's riding on it, and I'm a Calvinist. All right? Uh, no, seriously, we're not going to give you those notes. We're going to take names when this thing is over, and those that were faithful to the end will reap the reward of the notes. Anyway, we are going to provide you with these notes so that if you feel like, hey, I've covered something too quickly, or you're going, wait, I really wish he could back the train up a little bit and just go over what he just said, you're going to have it all in front of you, written out systematically. You'll be able to refer to it. There's footnotes. There's source material in it, meaning you're going to be able to check it all out. And that's all going to be available to you, and we will see to it you get that, uh, and we'll give that information out tomorrow. The question of truth and the question of human value are driving our national debates over abortion, over the definition of marriage, and over cloning and embryonic stem cell research. And to give you an example of where we are as a country, let me just describe for you what happened before we moved from Los Angeles, where I had lived most of my life, to Atlanta in 2004. At that time, my son Michael, my youngest son, was five. And I had him in Northridge Park in the San Fernando Valley, pushing him on the swing, and a well-dressed woman puts her daughter in the swing next to Michael and says, what do you do for a living that you can come to the park like most dads can't? How come you're here and they're working? And I tell you, folks, I don't like to get into it with people when I'm not on the job. I don't want to fight with you uh, when I'm not out speaking. I want to coach Little League. I want to, you know, do whatever. I don't want to fight with you. So I gave a cop-out answer. I do lectures on bioethics. Nobody ever asks what that is. She said, I don't like abortion. Uh-oh, we're into it now. What was the key word in that sentence? Like, I don't like abortion. I think it's bad, but I'm glad it's legal because I don't want to impose my beliefs on others who disagree. You've heard that, haven't you? Like every day? So very gently... And by the way, one of the things I will say to you this weekend is, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're not sledgehammers for Christ. We are ambassadors. That means we're gracious. We try to be nice. And when we're not nice, we repent, right? All right. So very gently, when she said, I, you know, just, I don't like abortion, but I don't want to impose my views. I said, can you tell me why you're personally opposed to abortion? 
And very gently, she responded and said, well, I'm opposed to it because everybody knows it's killing. You want to guess what my next question was? Can I repeat what you just told me? You personally oppose abortion because you say it's killing, but you want it to be legal to kill unborn humans? And she just pushed her daughter for a few more seconds. There must have been 10 seconds of pause, and she turned to me and said, you know what, you're right, I did just say that, and I don't like how that sounds now that you've kind of unpacked that for me. She bought into the notion that when it comes to moral truth, you should no more claim your right than if you were talking about your favorite flavor of ice cream. Welcome to your world, men and women. This is the world you live in. On the question of human value, there is a professor at the University of Colorado by the name of David Boonin. David Boonin has written the most intelligent book defending abortion you will ever read. David Boonin is not a flamethrower. He is not the politician you've seen breathing fire on television. He's not the street activist who shouts at anybody who attends church on Sunday. This is a guy who actually has a great deal of affection for pro-life people. He actually thinks they're more thoughtful than a lot of people on his side of the issue. Here's his book. Here's how he opens his book, which is a defense of abortion. He says the following. I'll paraphrase it for you. On the desk where I wrote this book, there is a series of photographs of my son Eli. In the first photograph, he is only a few hours old, and he's wearing a hat to preserve heat that he wore home from the hospital. In the next photograph, He's around six months old, and he's struggling to crawl on his grandparents' floor and even struggling to kind of sit up. In the next photograph, he's at the beach along the Gulf of Mexico, his wispy hair blowing in the wind. In each of these pictures, says David Boonin, we are looking at the same little boy. And then Boonin says this, get ready. In the top drawer of my desk, I keep another photograph of Eli, this one taken 24 weeks before he was born. The sonograph image, sonogram image is murky, but reveals clearly enough a hand out, outstretched toward the mouth, thumb extended toward the lips, and says Boonin, there is no doubt in my mind that this image also depicts the same little boy just at an earlier stage of his development. And, says Boonin, there is no doubt the thesis I will defend in this book is that it would have been perfectly permissible to have ended his life at that point. D does it get any more personal than that? Boonin says, that's my boy at the embryonic stage. That's my boy right now. Same guy. He didn't evolve from an embryo. He didn't come from a blob of tissue. That was him, and we can kill him anyway and listen to his reasoning because... Eli, as an embryo, as a fetus, lacked organized brain function to where he could have a desire for anything. And until you have desires, says Boonin, you have no right to life. In other words, your value as a human being is not based on whose image you bear. It's not based on the fact that you're simply a human being. It's based on the functions you perform. That's the worldview battle going on right now in our culture. And we wonder why kids are okay with pot? Th let's think about this for a moment. Why is marijuana okay with millions of so-called Christian kids? I know I speak at their worldview camps. You want, you want to see heck break loose? Make the, the point that you shouldn't be smoking pot and that that, that just isn't acceptable as a Christian. Well, why not? And you know why they question it? They have no idea what it means to be a being who bears the image of his maker. And as a result, it's an anything goes definition of human value. Why do people make a big stink right now about whether you identify as a man or a woman? Because human nature is up for grabs. Objective meaning is disappearing from us. We will talk about that tomorrow. Definition of marriage, the same thing. 
But you and I are on hostile turf tonight. And we are going to have to know how to make a case for the pro-life view on hostile turf. And we are going to have to be people who are equipped to engage. And to give you an example of what I mean by this, when my son Jeff graduated high school in 2009, I took him to the beaches of Normandy, France. When my kids graduate, they get a dad-kid trip. And it just so happened, this worked out well, I was going to be speaking in England anyway, so, you know, hop across the channel. And we went to Omaha Beach. How many of you have seen Saving Private Ryan? Remember the first 40 minutes of that film, how gruesome it was? The first wave of Army Rangers that hit the beach that day sustained nearly 80% casualties, injuries, and deaths. Why? Number one, the tide charts were wrong. The guys were dropped into water that wasn't shoulder deep. It was, in some cases, 20 feet deep, and they're carrying 100-pound packs and weaponry. They go straight to the bottom and drown before they even get a shot off. Those that don't drown live, but only by ditching their weaponry. Now they have to run across a beach unarmed with no weapons while they're being fired at with enfilading fire from the sides and from the front. And we're looking this scene over. Jeff and I are looking this over, and it's like, no way. And Jeff said, Dad, let's go down to the water. Let's wade out into the surf, and let's come back toward the beach the way our guys would have. Yeah, yeah we're talking a, an emotional moment. And of course, the French tour guide, with no sense of diplomacy whatsoever, is yelling at us in French, hurry up, you're holding up the whole group. I'm like, hey, babe, we saved your butts in this war. We're staying right here to enjoy this moment. But I couldn't help but be struck about what it would have been like to run across that beach without having what you needed to engage a well-entrenched foe. And men and women, that's where we are as Christians. We have to know how to make a case for life that can engage that culture in a way that is attractive, winsome, compelling, and we have a job description in front of us. And this weekend is about how we think biblically about the key issues where the battle lines are drawn right now. Abortion. We'll spend tonight talking about abortion. I will lay out a case for the pro-life view. I will deal with five bad arguments that people raise against the pro-life view and tell you why they don't work. And then tomorrow... I will deal with the single biggest objection, not only to the pro-life view, but to your Christian faith, the issue of relativism. What's the most popular bumper sticker in America today? You know what it is. Coexist. Why is that bumper sticker so popular? I'll tell you why tomorrow. <laughs> I told you you were all coming back. Then we're going to get into some really interesting areas where we as Christians not only need to think biblically out there in the culture, we need to think biblically right here within our own churches. We're going to talk about reproductive technologies. You want to know emotional pain? Have you ever spent time with a couple that wants to have kids but can't? I am telling you that pain on a 1 to 10 is a 13. I had one couple tell me they'd rather have cancer than have to walk through what they walked through. In fact, the wife had had cancer, and she said this was worse. So how do we help people in our churches think biblically about reproductive technologies that assist couples having children? Then, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. You will walk a loved one through their final days. I just did this with my sister five weeks ago. And I walked through what we're going to talk about. When is it okay, if ever, to withhold treatment? When is it okay to treat their pain even though it could, you could foresee it hastening death. Is that ever okay? 
What do you do when your dad or mom is in the final stages of cancer and that feeding tube is actually prolonging and increasing their suffering? What do you do in that situation? These are questions we as Christians have to be able to articulate biblical answers to. And we're going to do that. And then we're going to get into what could be, in our final session, the most interesting one. What does it mean to have a human nature, and is it ever okay to enhance it? Is it ever okay to alter the biological part of our nature to make us able to do more stuff? Now, as you can see, none of this will be controversial all weekend. Uh, yeah, I'm equipping all of you for Thanksgiving table next year, right? Where I know I will not be invited. Anyway, that's where we're going to go, and you're going to get exhaustive notes on all of this. Let's start tonight, though, with the issue of abortion. Everybody get ready to write down the three most important words when it comes to the issue of abortion. Are you ready? Three most important words. You've got to get these down. And I need you to pay very, very close attention to each word. Ready? Okay. Word number one, syllogism. Let me spell that for some of you. Some of you just looked at me and said, I didn't know we were doing Greek and Hebrew tonight. Syllogism, S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M. Syllogism. Word number two, make sure you get this. Syllogism. Anybody want to guess what the third word is? Yes, syllogism. So what's a syllogism? A syllogism is simply an argument put in, formal, in a formal structure. How about this? Socrates is a man. There's premise one. Premise two, all men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal, right? Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's a syllogism. Premise, premise, conclusion. Guess what? Pro-life Christians have a syllogism. And it is vitally important you know how to stick to it like glue. And I'll explain why before we're done tonight. Here's your pro-life syllogism. Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. You're free to write it if you want, but it will be in your notes. I just thought I'd share that as... Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, what's our conclusion? Abortion is wrong. Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong. Now that, men and women, is what we call an argument. An argument is not insulting someone and saying, you're not very attractive and neither is anybody else with your family name. That's an insult. An argument is where we actually lay out an argument, a case for our view. And step one is having a clearly defined syllogism. Premise one and by the way, we lock the doors at the end of each session and nobody leaves till they recite the syllogism. So you really are going to, you know, remember the old Eagles song? You can check out, but you can never leave. Uh, tonight, you don't get to leave until you know that syllogism. Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion is wrong. And we're going to look right now at three key questions that will establish the truth of that syllogism and its validity as well. The first question we're going to look at is, what is the unborn? The second question we'll look at is, what makes humans valuable? 
And then thirdly, we'll ask the question tonight, what's the point? What's the point? So let's look at that first question. What is the unborn? Our culture believes, men and women, that abortion is a complex issue. Abortion is not a complex issue. It's psychologically complex, but it's not morally complex. Here's what I mean by that. If you know a 14-year-old girl who's pregnant, and her boyfriend is going to dump her, her parents aren't supporting her, her school will kick her out, she will lose the opportunity to earn good money because she now has a kid, she'll lose the opportunity to go to college, do you feel sympathy for her? Of course. But does it follow there's no morally correct way to proceed? Whether abortion is right or wrong starts with the question, what is the unborn? Can we kill the unborn? That depends. What is the unborn? My friend Greg Kokel of Stand to Reason has a perfect illustration to get to the heart of this. He says, imagine you're at your kitchen sink one night washing dishes after supper. Your back is turned and your five-year-old boy comes in while your back's turned and says to you, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? Some of your ladies go, no, they would never ask such questions, would they? Little girl over here going, yeah, those little boys in my class do that all the time. Well, you see this ring on my finger here? It's been there for 30 years, 31 years this October, where I've been married to the most glorious woman in all of Christendom for that amount of time. And we have a son who is 26 U.S. Army, son 25 U.S. Army. We have a son 19 and a daughter 15. And I want to assure you that I have personally heard the question, Daddy, can I kill this, times without number. And almost often his hands are around his brother's throat when he's asking the question, Daddy, can I kill this? What's the first thing you want to know? What's the first question out of your mouth as a concerned parent? Not why. What? What has he got? Cockroach, snail, fire ant, do whatever you want, don't show your mother. Neighbor kitty, whoa. <laughs> and brother by the throat, you have issues, correct? You would never in a billion years say, sure, son, have at it, till you answered that predicate question, what has he got? I know some of you are going, wait a minute. This church brought this dude in from Atlanta for that? It's simple, but it gets us right to the heart of the abortion controversy. Can we kill the unborn? Yes, we can. If. If what? If the unborn are not human. I've done debates on college campuses. My most recent debate partner has been Malcolm Potts. You don't know Malcolm Potts, but Malcolm Potts was one of Planned Parenthood's first international medical directors. He was the guy who got Great Britain's abortion laws liberalized in 1967. He now teaches a population control course out at Berkeley. And once a year, I get to jump on the plane and fly out to that bastion of conservative thought out there to debate him in front of his own students. And I love it. I got 660 of his own students sitting out there. I have nothing to lose in that gig. Nothing. There's two of them who think like me. The rest don't. He's got everything to lose. And in our last debate, I was supposed to speak first. He preempted me. He walked up to the podium and he said to his students, Scott is here today because he wants to jam his religious view down your throat. In fact, he thinks he's got the answers to the whole universe. Scientists don't know when life begins. Philosophers don't know when life begins. Theologians don't know when life begins, but Scott knows. In fact, he's so certain of it, he feels he has the moral authority to take away your choices, and I find his arrogance appalling. It was great to be at Berkeley that day. He had 20 minutes to give an opening. He took about two minutes. I had 20 minutes. How much time do you think? Yeah, I took it all. 
Here were the opening words out of my mouth, which if he had bothered to research me, he would have known I was going to pull this on him. I said, men and women, I agree with everything Dr. Potts just said. He's right. Abortion should be legal through all nine months of pregnancy, no questions asked. He's right. Pro-lifers like me ought to butt out of this issue and let every person make up their own minds. He's right that no laws should govern the woman's autonomy. He's right that religious people shouldn't take their theological views and impose them on others. I agree with everything he just said. He's right if... Those two pro-life girls I just mentioned, they passed out at this point. If what? If the unborn are not human. And if Dr. Potts can use the science of embryology to demonstrate that the unborn are not one of us, and philosophy to show us that even if they are, we have no duty to value them, I will concede this exchange because I'm more committed to truth than I am ideology. In fact, men and women, I'm vigorously pro-choice on women choosing their own religion, choosing their own husbands, choosing their own careers, choosing their own cars, the pets they want to own, the car or the, the homes they want to own. I, I'm pro-choice on all that. But some choices are wrong, like intentionally killing an innocent human being simply because he's in the way of something we want. That's a choice a civil society should not allow. But if Dr. Potts can demonstrate for us empirically that the unborn are not human, I'm with him. Do you think he took me up on my little challenge? No. Here was his reply. I repeat, scientists disagree with theologians. Theologians disagree with philosophy, philosophers. Nobody knows when life begins. They all disagree with each other. That was his rebuttal. Men and women, you do not need a degree in rocket science to see the flaw in his thinking. How does it follow that because people disagree, nobody's right? Did people once disagree on whether women should have the right to vote? There's a dude going back there. You know, I really wish we could go back to those days. No, I won't point him out, though. He's running my microphone. That wouldn't be a good thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he looks back to the wall. No, it wasn't you. There was no dude. That was just another one of those jokes that went, it was magic. But anyway, um, did people once disagree on whether the earth was flat or round? Did they once disagree on whether African Americans were citizens with rights? Did it follow there were no right answers? The absence of consensus, says Hadley Arcus, does not mean an absence of truth. But there was a deeper flaw here. Notice what Dr. Potts said. We don't know if the unborn are human. Therefore, we can kill them. If we don't know if the unborn are human, should we be killing them? If you're driving home tonight and you see what looks like an old black coat in the road, but it could be an elderly gentleman who had a little bit too much to drink at the pub, are you going to run the coat over or err on the side of caution? Err on the side of caution. Or to borrow an example from former President Ronald Reagan. If you're out hunting and you see bushes rustling in front of you, and you don't know if it's that deer you've been after or your best buddy, do you open fire? Not unless you're Dick Cheney, right? You err on the side of caution. There's no way you're going to open fire. Pastor, that's my only political joke that I'll try to throw in here unless I forget. If we don't know if the unborn are human, we shouldn't be killing them. It's that simple. You got to answer the question, what is the unborn, before you answer the question, can we kill the unborn? And you know what the problem is, men and women? Millions of Americans never answer. They don't even ask the question, what is the unborn? They simply assume the unborn are not human. I'm going to pick on you for a moment, but I reward everybody I pick on. 
No, don't look over at him. I'm going to pick on you. Um, now, do you have a, a brother? What's his name? Jerome. And what's your name? Lydia, have you stopped beating your brother jo Jerome yet? Have you stopped beating him? Yes. You did. Okay. Was that through prayer and deliverance or how did that healing come about? I didn't ask you that. Have you stopped? <laughs> you have. Okay. I'm glad you have. Now, was that a fair question? What was wrong with the question? By the way, free book for you. See me afterward. I reward everybody I pick on. Everybody's, I could just see everybody going, yeah, man, would somebody attack me? Yeah, I could just see it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, was it a fair question? Why not? What did I assume? Did I prove it? Did I give any evidence? I just assumed it. And people do this with the unborn all the time. How many of you read the book, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Those of you that maybe it's been a few years, I think it's chapter 32 or 23, I can't remember which. Huck, being the adventurous boy that he is, has been out messing around all afternoon. He's late for supper, and he knows Aunt Sally is going to hammer him. And so he puts together a lie to get out of getting in trouble. He knows Aunt Sally will pound him to dust. So when he shows up late for dinner, he says, Oh, well, ma'am, we would have been on time, but we had to take a steamboat to get here, and the steamboat blew a cylinder head. I mean, complete lie. Aunt Sally says, Well, did anybody get hurt? No, ma'am. It killed a Negro, but nobody got hurt. Aunt Sally says, well, that's good because sometimes people do get hurt. Whoa. What was just assumed about the black man? That he wasn't one of us. On the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, two years ago, the President of the United States, celebrating the Supreme Court case that gave us abortion on demand, said the following. Today, we remember a day that all Americans should take joy in. Because, said the president, get ready, here's the quote, because this is a nation where everyone deserves the right to pursue their own dreams. What was just assumed about the unborn? That they're not one of us. The president didn't argue for it. He simply assumed it. I'm going to give you a little tactic now that will help you when people assume the unborn aren't human. Sometimes they do it innocently. They don't mean to. They're like that woman at the park. They just haven't really thought deeply about this issue. But you need to flush that assumption out into the open. C.S. Lewis said the most dangerous ideas in our culture are the ones that are simply assumed. Those are the most dangerous ones. So, let's take a look at this assumption that the unborn aren't human. And let me give you some examples of how people do this, and then I'll show you how this tactic works. You'll all be doing this in your sleep by tomorrow. It's, it's real easy. It's called trot out the toddler. Every time you hear an argument for abortion, the first thought I want you to have in your head is this. Would this work as a good argument for killing a toddler? If the answer is no, what are they assuming about the unborn that they're not assuming about the toddler? That the unborn aren't human like the toddler, right? Now, please listen to me very carefully for a moment. We do not use trot out the toddler to argue the unborn are human like the toddler. We're going to do that in the next step. The first thing we're doing is simply framing the argument. Here's a little piece of advice from debate coaches. He or she who frames the exchange wins it. That's true everywhere but marriage. Where really, guys, the best thing is to just say, I repent, I'll do better next time, and things tend to go better.
Is that your argument, sir? <laughs> Somebody next to you is turning beet red, but that's okay. So let's try this. Let's frame the argument using trot out the toddler. Somebody says to you, how come you don't trust women to make their own personal decisions? You've heard this? And you're thinking, okay, wait a minute. I, I don't hate women. I'm not for a war on women. How do I convince this person I don't hate women? Wrong question. What I want you to do instead is put your hand at about knee level. And the first words out of your mouth need to be these. Pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want us to trust them to rough him up in the privacy of the bedroom. Should we trust them to make that decision? What's the answer going to be? No. Your reply, two words. Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Your reply, one word, said melodically. Ah. Some of you can say that better than me. When I sing, things die, but you might be able to really pull that off. Ah. If the unborn are human, like that toddler, should we kill the unborn in the name of privacy? or trusting women any more than we'd kill a two-year-old for that reason? Oh, that's different. The unborn aren't human, the toddler is. Ah, that's the question we need to resolve. Before we talk about choice, before we talk about privacy, before we talk about trusting women, we've got to answer the question, what is the unborn? Nobody kills two-year-olds in the name of choice and who decides, do they? Unless they're really in trouble up here? Right. So they're assuming the unborn aren't human, and trot out the toddler flushes that assumption out into the open where it can be dealt with. So let's try it. Somebody comes to you and says, well, what about a poor mother? She's already got eight kids by eight different men. She's pregnant with a ninth. She can't feed the eight. They're welfare kids. They don't even go to school. And you're going to force her to bring another kid into this world, another child into this world that she can't feed? Stop right there. What did they just assume about the unborn? Notice their language. Bring another child into the world? Do we accept that proposition? She already has a child, right? The question is, what is she going to do with him? So trot out your toddler. I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents can't afford to feed him. In fact, the family budget for the remaining seven children would be a whole lot better if we simply eliminated the poverty problem by eliminating the extra mouth to feed. Should they be allowed to kill the two-year-old to make the checkbook balance at the end of the month? In other words, when human beings get expensive, may we kill them? What's the answer going to be? No, you can't do that. Your reply? Some of you are too anxious for the awe. I could just see it in your eyes. You're, you're about ready to come out of your chairs. No, not yet. Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Ah. Ah, uh, what? Not aha. Uh -huh. Ah, uh, if the unborn are human like that toddler, should we be killing the unborn? in the name of economic hardship any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? Well, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Ah, that's the question we need to resolve first before we talk about privacy, choice, economic hardship, yada, yada, yada. Everybody with me so far? Let's try one more. <coughs> Somebody comes to you and says, well, wait a minute. I, if we allow or if we disallow abortion, we're going to have all these unwanted kids running around that are going to grow up abused and abandoned. And you're going to tell me that the more humane thing to do would be to allow child abuse rates to swell rather than deal with this problem before they ever come into the world. Stop right there. What's just been assumed about the unborn? That they're not human. Because by the way, if the unborn aren't human, or if the unborn are human, isn't abortion Bad like child abuse is bad? Yeah. So they're assuming something. Let's flush that assumption out into the open. I have a two-year-old in front of me. He's been roughed up already, and by the time he's five, he's going to be really roughed up by abusive parents. 
would it be okay to kill him now to prevent him being roughed up later? What's the answer going to be? No, you can't do that. Your reply? Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Ah, if the unborn are human like that toddler, should they be killed in the name of unwantedness any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? That's different. Ah, that's the question we need to resolve. Are the unborn human like that toddler? Now, by the way, have I even yet argued the unborn a human? No, I have not. I'm simply setting parameters around the debate. And why am I telling you to do this? Why am I telling you about a syllogism? Here's why. When abortion comes up in discussion, have you ever noticed it goes off in 30 different rabbit trails? This is how you keep people on message. This is how you keep the main thing the main thing. You focus like a laser beam on the question, what is the unborn? Let me answer it for you. What is the unborn? Now, pastor, I am not going to go to the Bible to answer the question. It's the wrong place to go. The room just got real quiet. We're not going to go to the Bible. We're going to go to the Book of Mormon. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I woke everybody up that was tempting to snooze right now. They all, whoa. <laughs> all right, get ready. We're going to go to the science of embryology. And let me explain why. The question, what kind of thing is the unborn is not a theological question. It's an empirical question, like asking what kind of thing is a dog or a, uh, or a fish, right? Now, we're going to do Bible. Don't worry, okay? But not yet. Let's first ask, what are we dealing with here? And here's what the science of embryology tells us. And I will footnote this extensively in your notes. From the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. From the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. Everybody hold your hand like this for a moment. And I want you to start plucking skin cells off the back of your hand. Go ahead, just give yourself a good pinch. If your neighbor's not doing it, grab some cells off the back of his neck or something. I don't know. All right? Congratulations. You just sent a couple of hundred somatic cells hurling to their deaths on the table in front of you. Did you know that each one of those cells contains your entire DNA encoding? In fact... We're going to be able very shortly, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Very shortly, we're going to be able to take the, the nucleus of one of those DNA cells in your body, and we're going to be able to clone another living human entity from it. Okay? You just sent a couple hundred of those puppies hurling to their deaths. Did you just commit mass homicide? No, you didn't. And you know why. These cells on the back of your hand are merely part of a larger human entity, you. They are not distinct whole living entities the way you were when you were an embryo, the way I was when I was an embryo. That's the science of embryology. Well, of course, people are going to raise objections. Let me just run you through some. These will be in your notes. The first thing they'll bring up is twinning. Why, that early embryo could split into two up till 21 days. That embryo that starts as one breaks into two. How can you claim it's a whole living being from the very beginning when it could split? Question, how does it follow that because a living entity splits that it wasn't a whole living entity prior to the split? Has anybody here ever cut a flatworm in half? What do you get when you cut a flatworm in half? Two flatworms. Does it follow there was no flatworm prior to the split? You'll also hear people say, well, wait a minute. Women 
don't grieve miscarriages the way that they grieve the death of a newborn or a toddler. Well, first of all, those people are out of touch with a lot of women I know and a lot of men I know. They're just, they're out of touch. Because I will tell you, the heartbreak of that is real. And it's good for our churches to rally around people who've suffered that and love on them because they have lost a family member. I know we don't intuitively go there. We tend to think that it's different. But you know what? They've lost a family member. And that's not easy. And I wish I had an answer for why God allows that. I don't. But it doesn't change for a moment. They've lost something of dear value to them. But the argument goes like this from our friends out there. Women don't grieve miscarriages like they do newborns who die. All right, let's say for a moment they were right. They're not, but let's say they were. How do my feelings about something change what it is? If I got a message when I get back to the hotel tonight indicating that one of my own children had died tonight, will I feel worse about that than hearing on the news that 500 children died in India today from malnutrition? Does it follow my kid is more human than those children? No. My feelings about something don't change what it is. You'll also hear people say, well, nature spontaneously triggers miscarriages. Nature, it seems, has no problem with abortion. Now, okay, when you hear that, as Dr. Potts tried to lay on me when I debated him, you're dealing with someone who's really, really ignorant of basic biology. And quite frankly, I expected better from an MD. How does it follow that because nature spontaneously triggers a miscarriage, that A, the children in question were not human, or B, we may intentionally kill them? You see the problem here? Earthquakes happen in third world countries. Thousands of people are killed. Does that justify mass murder? It's an example of what we call the is-ought fallacy. Just because something is the case doesn't mean it ought to be. And yet many of our secularist friends have bought into this. Another one you'll get is that sometimes pregnancies develop into molar pregnancies or tumors. That embryo, so the argument goes, morphs into a tumor. How can we claim then that it's a human being from the very beginning? Anybody who tells you that is really, really ignorant about embryology. Let me put this to you real clearly. Molar pregnancies do not start off as complete living human organisms the way you did at the embryonic stage and then morph into tumors. They were tumors from the very beginning. How many of you know the alphabet song? Twinkle, twinkle, little star? <laughs> Okay, guys, come on, just nod. It's all right. You learned it in kindergarten. We're not going to hold it over your head. Now, I won't ask you to sing it, and I'm certainly not going to sing it, but don't those two songs sound the same when they first start off? But what happens after the fifth measure? You quickly learn they're not the same song. In the same way, molar pregnancies do not start off as embryos and change into something else. They never were embryos. They always were molar pregnancies. And anybody who tells you different doesn't know basic embryology. One last objection you'll get, the burning research lab. Oh, this one's fun. It goes like this. You pro-lifers don't believe your own rhetoric. You don't believe those embryos are human because if you did, you would behave differently. And I'll demonstrate you don't believe it. Pretend you're in a burning research lab. In this corner by the light over there, below the light, is a newborn baby. In this corner over by the exit sign is a vial full of frozen embryos. This building is an inferno. You do not have time to save both. You can either save the newborn or the vial full of 12 frozen embryos. Where are we all going? We're all going to the newborn. 
And by the way, that's the right decision. And our critic then says, see, even you don't believe those embryos are human because you automatically went for the newborn. There goes your whole case. Question, how does it follow that because I save one human over others, that the ones left behind are less human? Pretend this building is on fire. And I have a choice of saving all of you or my 15-year-old daughter, Emily Rose. Who is going to fry? Yeah, yeah. I won't shoot you on the way out, but I'm saving her first because I'm her dad. And I have a responsibility to her I don't have to you. I'm getting her out first, then we'll come back. Does it follow you're less human than she is because I save her first? Not at all. These are all very bad arguments against the pro-life view. I do get one, though, that I think we could maybe just use a little help on. If we're honest and we look at a picture of an embryo at maybe the 10 cell stage and it looks just like a little ball of cells, it's kind of hard to think, wow, that's one of us because our intuitions don't naturally go there. But let me see if I can reorient our intuitions a little bit. Pretend you're on a safari. This is an example from Richard Stith, and it's the pre-digital era, and you have, in the year 1970, a Polaroid camera. Does anybody here under the age of 45 know what a Polaroid camera is? No, you're not. I think some of you are raising your hand thinking you're under the age of 45. I hear your confession, but you're saying it so doesn't make it so. Are you teaching word of faith here, Pastor? What's going on here? Now, Polaroid cameras for you young ones, the way it worked when your parents were growing up, you shot a picture and it recorded it on this stuff called film and you had to shoot 36 or 24 exposures. Then once you got all the pictures shot, you took the film out of the camera and you drove it to the far corner of the supermarket parking lot to this little shack called Photomat. And you would drop the film off and you'd wait a month for your pictures to come back, half of them overexposed. That was the unbelievable horror we lived in prior to your smartphones. Now, pretend you're on a safari. It's 1970. You're on a Mexican safari, and you have a Polaroid camera because the Polaroid camera was the answer to the photomat problem. You'd shoot a picture. It was a very ugly-looking thing, really. It was. It looked like Satan who invented it. It was really ugly. You'd shoot the picture, but it would spit the picture out, and it would be a white piece of paper, and then you'd just wait, and then it would. you'd shake it a little bit, yep, and you'd wait, and about 90 seconds to two minutes later, your picture emerged. You didn't have to go to Photomat. It was right there. You're on a safari. You shoot a picture in this Mexican jungle of a black jaguar jumping across the trail in front of you. Nobody shoots pictures of black jaguars, but you got it on your Polaroid. And while you're waiting, I come up to you while you're waiting for the picture to emerge that you just snapped. I rip the Polaroid camera out of your hand. I yank the paper out of the camera, and I tear it up. Are you mad at me? Yeah, you are. What if I said to you the following? What's the big deal? No jaguar there in that picture. That was just a white paper with a brown smudge on it. Is that going to get me off the hook? You're going to look at me incredulous, and you're going to say, brown smudge on a piece of paper? Are you kidding me? The jaguar in the picture was already there. We just couldn't see him yet. In the same way, men and women, you were already there from the one cell stage. We just couldn't see you. That is the science of embryology.